Thank you, Jake. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to talk this session about event sourcing, Redux, and React applications. Now, this session is more about architecture. I use Redux and React as examples, but this would basically apply to any JavaScript application, or for that matter, even any smart client, server-side uh, application, desktop application. The architecture is universally applicable. So who am I? My name is Maurice de Beyer. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm freelance instructor, developer, and I consult to lots of companies doing stuff. So if you want to learn more about React, I've recently started the Kickstarter com campaign. And with any luck, if it gets funded, I'm going to create a whole course about React where you can do learn much more. So if you want to go there, that's the link. So why am I interested in event sourcing and these kind of architecture things? Well, I want to make better applications. And that's a goal I've had for a long time. And there is a lot involved with making better applications. The front end has to be better. And React helps me a lot there. Data manipulation in the front end has to be better. That's where Redux comes in, helps me a lot. But on the server side, we have to do things a lot better as well. And one of the reasons things need to be better is because of fires like this. One of my main customers creates safety software for the oil and gas industry. And we kind of try to prevent these accidents from happening. Now, we don't control people. We can't actually forcibly stop someone from doing something wrong. But we do create software where all the work is planned. And we kind of evaluate, well, if someone is going to open up a gas main line and someone else is going to do some welding, then torches, sparks, free gas, that's probably not a good combination. You probably want to separate those in time so they don't happen at the same time. Or you will get accidents like this happen. So traditionally, people have been storing data in all sorts of ways. You might have been using relational data or an object database like MongoDB. And typically, in the traditional application, architecture used to be quite simple. We have something like this at a very high level. So on the left, we've got our database. And in the middle, we've got our server application. And that server application grabs data from the database whenever a client connects. The client is on the left-hand side. Oh, sorry, the right-hand side. It's the browser running our React application in this case. And it kind of passes that data to the client. And then whenever the client has made some kind of changes, it passes the data back to the server. The server probably does some sort of validation and then stores it in the database. This is the kind of system you might end up if you just use RESTful styles of working with data. And that's fine if you've got a relatively simple application. If you've got a to-do application, you're not going to have a lot of multi-user contention. Most people manage their own to-do list. No one else is going to touch that. Maybe in the case of a manager, he'll have a secretary managing his to-do list. But in that case, it's probably the secretary doing all the work. And even if you create to the to-do list to rule them all, is the whole world is going to use it. You'll have lots of small lists, but there won't be much interaction. And a relatively simple architecture is going to be just fine. But if you want to create a React component to render something like that, in this case, it's not for to-do applications. It's actually for work permits. You might end up with a React component like this. Really simple. It just takes in a list. It's got no clue where it actually came from. It knows there is something that it can do. It can draft a permit, which basically means we're building up a whole permit request specifying what we want to do, where we want to do it, when, what kind of tools we want to use, etc. But the React component doesn't really know where it came from, how it's treated. They're really simple. And that's how your React components should typically be. So if you've got a little more complex application, which our application is, you want to be a bit more explicit about updating things. And that's where the CQRS pattern or command and query responsibility segregation comes in. 
And in CQRS, commands are very important. Commands are used from the client to update things. So we're not taking a resource like in a RESTful system, downloading it, changing it, sending that whole resource back. No, we're very explicit about, I've got a resource, I want to make some changes to it, this is why I want to do it. If you take all your command names and you give those to some kind of, say, business analyst or end user, he should be able to understand that. So a command like update fields is a lousy command. It doesn't convey business value. Draft permit, pay check, um, check credit uh, records. Those are valid commands and something which makes sense. And if you use CQRS, the architecture will become somewhat more complex, like this. On the right-hand side, we've still got our browser application using React. If it wants to get some data from the service, it goes to the query service at the top. And the query service is probably a RESTful service, but all it does is get data. It never responds to a put or a post or a delete. It only retrieves data, purely read-only. So what if you want to change something? Well, the client sends very explicit commands to the server. So the commands go down to the bottom, to the command service. It does all the validation. It could potentially reject the command. Like you want to deposit or you want to withdraw some money from your bank account, but you don't actually have enough money. Well, in that case, your request is rejected. Your command is not valid and the client would get a 400 style error back. But assuming the command is valid, the database gets updated and the client or any other connected client could actually retrieve that through the query service. So what does a command like that look like in JavaScript? Well, it's really simple. Commands are really simple objects. We try to keep them as flat as possible. It's just a bag of data. A Couple of interesting things though. First of all, every command has an ID. In some cases, in more complex applications, especially if you've not got the perfect connection, like we do when we have to work with offshore platforms, you might get commands which get sent twice. After all, if you've got a timeout from some HTTP request, you don't really know what happens. Did my command reach the server and was the response timed out? Or did it never actually receive the server? So. Every command has a unique ID. If it's resent for some reason, then the server can check based on that command ID. Am I duplicating the same command? And if so, can reject it because it's already done it. The other important thing is the command name. What are we actually intending to do here? And based on the command name, there will be a whole bunch of other data, or maybe very little in case of delete a permit then all you would need to know, the permit ID to delete, and that's all. But in this case, with draft permits, there is a whole bunch of data about the permits there. After a command like this has been successful, we kind of need to update the Redux store on the client. So in Redux, you typically have actions to signify that something happened. And an action is very strongly related to a command, the command is, okay, I want to do something. Well, the action is, okay, that's been done. It was successful. Now go and update the data on the client. So you see this action. Notice the difference. The command was draft permit, so command intents. The action is permit drafted. We know the draft command has been successful, so it's past tense. And the data in there is going to be pretty much the same thing. So that's nice, that gives us a much better architecture, but it still leaves us with one big problem. If we looked at the database, it only has the current state in there. And it's like, how did we get there? If you look at this rock formation, which is in the west of France, it's kind of like a beautiful rock formation, but how did it get to be the way it is? Did we have a solid rock there once upon a time, and did the waves break a big hole into it? Or maybe was it deposited on top and did the deposit grow up to form that arch? You really can't tell. All we've got is the current state. And if you think about databases, 
you quite often experience problems like, well, something in the database is wrong. Like there is something which should not be the way it is. It's invalid, we know that. But how did it get to be in that invalid state? We don't know. All we can say is, well, okay, it's invalid now. Somehow that happened. Maybe we've got some logic error, but we really don't know how it got to be that way. But we'll write some kind of SQL script to patch it, and then we're good to go again. And maybe a month later, the same problem occurs again. Still no clue why it happened. So we really want to know a bit more about how stuff got to be the way it is. So that's where event sourcing comes in. Event sourcing is really something which is theoretically quite old. It's based on accounting and bookkeeping, which has been used for ages. And a guy called Greg Young basically implemented that in data storage. So he said, well, instead of just storing the current state, we're going to store everything that leads up to the current state, all of those events. And if you think about that draft permit command I showed a few minutes ago, well, if that was successful, we would change some state. Well, in an event source system, we would store an event permit drafted. And like the command could be validated and rejected if it was invalid, the event is stored if it is successful. So we know it's happened, it's history, which also means it's never going to change. We're only going to add more to, or to the table of events. So if someone makes a change to that permit, does another draft uh, command, it's not going to override the first permit drafted event. No, it's going to create a second one, and they kind of stack on top of each other. And the current state is a result of applying all those commands, or all those events, I should say. In functional terms, the current state is a left fold of all stored events. Now, it turns out that's something which is relatively new in computer terms, but in real life has been used for ages and ages, even back in the days of the pharaohs. Bookkeeping always had the rule, like, we don't just store the current state, we store transactions. And even back then, the pharaoh might have had 10 cows, and one would be born. Then they wouldn't cross out the 10, given that they used clay tablets and papyrus back then. Crossing that would probably be quite hard. But they would add another line, cow born on whatever date, and number one. And when they got to the bottom of the clay tablet, they would kind of sum them up and start a new tablet and say at the top, current status is the pharaoh has 11 cows. And then they would record sales, deaths, purchases, etc., and kind of keep tally that way. Now, bookkeeping has been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. Even the modern double entry bookkeeping is hundreds of years old. It was invented around 1500 by an Italian monk, and he created the double book entry bookkeeping system, which basically prevents lots of mistakes and makes it really easy to detect errors if they've been made. So in that respect, it's really nothing new. And one of the great things, it gives a perfect audit log. We know exactly what happened, when it happened, how it happened, usually by who it happened, depending on what you store in the event, but usually you store all those things. So if you run into the database and you detect some kind of anomaly there, you say, well, that state isn't what it should be. It really should be something different. Instead of saying, well, I don't know how it got to be there, but it is there, now we can actually go through all the events being stored for that item and track, well, okay, these changes were made, these changes were made, and you can determine what change actually caused the error. Maybe there is something wrong with command validation. Maybe there is something wrong with updating the current state. At least you've got a complete track of what happened, so you can log that. So if we look at the high-level architecture for an event-driven system, we'll see something like this. So on the right-hand side, we've still got our browser application using React and Redux, and it still connects up to that same two services, the commanding service and the query service. So as far as the client concerned, there is really no difference. All the difference here is at the back end. 
the command service basically takes each command, turns into an event. It gets stored in its own database. Whatever you want to use, there, there are different libraries, implementations you can use. There is a projector service, which basically picks up the whole stream of events coming in. And it says, well, if this event happened, then I want to show it in some way. And it updates a projection database for that. Now, I would say projection database, but it could be plural. You could actually project into different databases. You might say, well, I've got a relational database for normal projections, but I use Elasticsearch for file searching. And I might use uh, MongoDB for document database for yet other services. And the query site actually queries that projection database. So why do we need two different databases, the projections and the event store? Well, the event store is just a list of everything leading up to the current state, which makes it very hard to query for lots of queries. Now, there are actually some queries which are really efficient to do that. Like you could ask from, well, whoever drafted the permit and then deleted it within five minutes after that, something you can't really easily query in a normal database. But if you want to know about all permits for a given drilling platform or, or all customers that are overdraft, that's a lot harder to do in an event database. And that's very easy in a projection database because you can basically choose whatever you want and whatever is most suitable for your need. But we can actually expand a bit on this architecture because if we've got a projector service which receives every event, we can also create another service which says, well, I'll also receive all events and I'm going to use push notifications to all connected clients. Use something like WebSockets or Socket.io or whatever technology you want, long polling could work. But basically, every client that's connected can indicate whatever data it's interested in and it gets notifications of whatever changed. It will receive all those events. Now, you can have as many clients connected as you want, someone makes a change and everyone else sees that change. And even if they're editing something, as long as the two edits are not an actual conflict, like the current uh, bank account balance for a client might be updated through an event and another user is changing their address, well, they're both related to a customer, but it's not really a conflict because it's different item would be affected by different events, different commands. So that would still be perfectly fine to update. So what does that look on the client side? Well, we've got our views, which is basically what the user sees. They're typically done with React, at least in our application that's done with React. But that could be Angular, it could be some simple view library, uh, say Moustache or something like that. We've got Redux, which is by far the most popular Flux implementation. And it has its store, which is basically the current states of whatever data you're working with. That gets updated by actions. And those actions are updated in part by user actions in the view and in part by server actions from, as a result of other users being pushed back through a WebSocket API. So we've got a really nice architecture with really cleanly defined data flows, which makes everything very predictable, very performance, and very easy to understand. Now, I mentioned projections. And a lot of time when people start working with event source systems, projection cause some issues. What is a projection? How should it look? How should you shape your projection? Where should you project? Well, it really depends on your needs. Like I've got a map here. It's a map of the world. It's a Mercator projection. And I, at least I assume it's an accurate map. I haven't actually checked that. But I've got another map of the world here based on exactly the same data. This is a more white projection. So they're very different projections based on the same data because there are different needs. If we flip back to the Mercator projection, if you take a look at Greenland, the big white blob at the top, it looks about the same size as Africa. Turns out that's not the case. 
the mole-wide projection is specifically made so you can compare areas. So you can see that Greenland is a lot smaller than Africa, and in reality it's about the size of the Arabian Peninsula. So what's the point of this map then? Well, it turns out for navigation, if you're moving a ship across the ocean, a Mercator projection is really nice. Because if you draw a straight line on a Mercator projection map, you get a straight compass heading, and if you follow that compass heading, assuming there is no drift and wind and anything, but you'll end up exactly where you wanted to go. And with the mole-wide projection, that's not the case. So different projections based on the same data for different needs. So it's actually fine if you want to start projecting out data, and you're going to project it out in many, many different shapes, depending on your needs. And the good thing with a vent source system, the source of truth is not the projections. The projections are just a read-only view of whatever is the current state. The source of truth is the stored events. So if you come up with a new projection you need sometime later, well, you can just create it based on all the stored events. You just reread them again and create a new projection. So you can throw away your projections and basically rebuild all of that whenever you want to. So what does the Redux code look like on the client? I've got here a simple example. And you basically see a Redux reducer, which takes all the incoming actions, like the one I showed previously, and it checks the type and it decides how it should handle the type. By default, it kind of says, well, uh, the default action at the bottom, I don't know anything to do about this action, so I'm just going to return the state as is. But in this case, for the permit added or permit drafted commands, it actually knows how to handle those and does something. And now this only handles the case of permits, the collection of permits. It doesn't worry about how to handle individual permits. Individual permits are done by a different producer. So it knows if a single permit is drafted, how the state inside of that permit actually changes. Now Redux basically combines all those different producers into one complex tree, and every time an action is fired, that tree gets a chance to handle that, and it decides how the current state should be. So even though the terminology is very different than used in event sourcing systems, in reality, it's really the same thing. An action in Redux is an event in the event source system. It's something that happens. We project it in the event source system. Well, we reduce it in Redux. End result is we've got some state to work with. So how do we wire things up? Well, inside of our... React application, we have a startup. So at the bottom you can see that react.render, which actually should be react.dom.render. This code is slightly old, sorry about that. And you see that our application, the app element, is wrapped inside a provider. That provider is provided by uh, React Redux, which basically connects Redux to React. Like I mentioned before, Redux could be used anywhere without React. But that connects the two up, and that makes all the data stored inside our Redux store available for all React components. Next thing is, okay, now we need that components to have data. So one of the first components I showed that list of permits needs to have the list of permits to display. And you do that using another thing React Redux provides the connect function, which basically says, well, connect up some data from the store. What? Well, there is a map state to props, so it maps state from the store to properties in React. And in this case, it just says, well, map all the permits from that store into the properties of the component. So it has its list of permits. The other thing the original component had was that draft permit command. So it needs to know how to handle that. And the second function here on the slide is actually intended for that. So map dispatch to props. Dispatching means 
dispatch and action, so something in the back end, producers, APIs, etc., get to handle that. So with this, we've basically completed the circle. We've got React components which are completely unaware of how the data works. They're purely focused on rendering. We've got Redux, which is all about the client-side state, which is fed on the one hand by user actions, on the other hand by push notifications from the server. We've got the server, which stores all the events resulting in the commands being sent in a database and projects those out into a read model of whatever shape we need. And we've got a very scalable and very nice architecture. So with that, I'm slightly ahead of time, but at the end of my presentation, all my slides will be on SlideShare later this afternoon. So on the right-hand bottom, you can see my Twitter accounts. If you just check my Twitter accounts uh, somewhere at the end of the afternoon, you'll find the tweet there pointing to the slides on SlideShare. And with that, I would like to thank you for inviting me and presenting to you. Thank you.